But of course, we're watching for the market to open in just a minute's time. As I mentioned, a little bit of weakness expected. Let's get our views from our guests today. We've got Chris Conway from Australian Stock Report, plus Tom Madden from Leyland Private Asset Management joining us right now. And good morning to you both, gentlemen. Tom, I'll start with you because, of course, we have seen, um, I guess, markets today in terms of SPY showing a little bit of weakness expected to creep in uh, to the broader index today. What are you expecting and what are you watching on, on markets at the moment? When it, with us, we're, we're uh, I think, as I've, I've mentioned before, we're actually, we're, we're long-term value guys. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at the day-to-day -day movements of the market, it really doesn't uh, phase us too much. We, we tend to focus on an individual companies. Uh, so we're not looking at, at big global macro trends. We tend to, to kind of hammer down on individual businesses that we think uh, are often maybe a little bit out of favour or, or seeing a bit of weakness and then looking at, at what's causing that weakness and then potentially buying businesses. So for us, uh, it's a little bit immaterial what, what happens mm. day to day. Uh, but look, obviously we'd like to see the market go up. Everything that's going on in the US at the moment, mm. I think is, is everything seems to be going well. So uh, look, I, I can't be sure what's gonna happen today uh, throughout the session, but uh, if, we're, if we're following the US uh, and the recent trends we've been seeing there, then hopefully it's a good one. Well, I guess that's the key, to, um, and I'll bring in Chris on this one, because, I mean, looking at macro, and I realise, you know, uh, you're both sort of long-term, but looking at the macro environment, how are you reading it? Because, Chris, obviously we are seeing these continued gains in the US. Yes, we saw a bit of a breather in the NASDAQ overnight. Um, but we are seeing this in the ASX to an extent as well, you know, post-GFC sort of highs. Uh, do you expect this to take a breather anytime soon? I mean, yes, we're seeing perhaps a little bit of weakness, although the market has opened in positive territory, I should mention, just ever so slightly. Uh, but what are you watching? I mean, in terms of the macro, themes, Chris. Good morning, Ingrid. It's been a very long time since you and I last spoke. Um, I'm actually not long term, I'm short term. So hopefully I can provide a little bit more insight as to what I think might happen today. I think uh, the Australian market will hopefully get back to at least square. I think the SPY futures, uh, it's a bit of a misdirection. Um, mm. There were some US centric themes overnight, obviously, with what uh, the Commerce Secretary said and the whole tit for tat possible trade war between mm. the US and China. But commodities were stronger overnight. We all know our market is a commodities heavy market. So I'm hoping we can at least lift to break even by the close of session today. Interesting that you said that uh, I know it's uh, we, we've got the staggered open. We're not fully open yet, but uh, mm. the market was positive just with probably the A's and B's and C's. Yeah, exactly. BHP helping, no doubt. That, that. They're always looking at that one to give us a bit of direction for the day. Six tenths of percent stronger. Um, and I guess, Chris, just looking, sticking with you for a moment, given your short term, um, looking at the recent moves, do you expect to see, I mean, what's your sort of view for the next kind of couple of weeks to see where the market heads? Given the fact we've got reporting season coming up, that's going to be key, obviously, to see if we can get the next leg up, right? Sorry, Ingrid, you were breaking up a little bit there, but I think I got the bulk of your question. Um, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. We don't have the narrative here in Australia as the US does. Obviously, that's all about Trump tax cuts and the benefits that will flow to company bottom lines there. We don't have a similar sort of narrative here at the moment. Obviously, mm. we've just been through the December, January period where everyone talks about the Santa Claus rally. We did indeed get that. And now we're sort of uh, in a quiet zone until reporting season. So that's not to say that I think the market will go lower or conversely head higher. I think we probably wade sideways for a little bit of the next couple of weeks. And then through reporting season, what everyone's going to be hoping is that uh, the E catches up to the P. So obviously prices have run ahead for a lot of stocks. Mm. We need to see throughout our report, reporting season that earnings are justifying those prices that we've all been paying for stocks up at these higher levels. So I think that will be the narrative um, and hopefully it is a good reporting season. All right, I want to bring uh, Tom back in on Yowie because we're watching this stock. Obviously, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that stock absolutely plunge, Tom, um, after downgrading some, or slashing, I should say, its sales growth forecast. But looking today, we've had some sales numbers in for Q2. Net sales, uh, 5.4 million. That's 23% improvement versus the pre previous corresponding uh, period. What's your take on Yowie going forward? Because there's a lot of, I guess, negative sentiment in this stock at the moment. Are you seeing that as a buying opportunity? Uh, look, Yowie is, is, is an interesting story, uh, you know, selling uh, toys wrapped in chocolate to kids, I know that, <laughs> that it's very popular. Uh, in, the, in the US they have the exclusive rights to, to do that, they're the only people that are allowed to, uh, to actually sell toys in chocolate for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Uh, from what I understand, and again I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this, but our take is uh, that, uh, that, I guess, defensive moat, if you'd call it that, is, is going to be taken away. Uh, so I think in April this year, at some stage, the, the Kinder Surprise will be allowed into America. I think I'm not 100% on this, but I'm, I think this is happening. 
which is going to really uh, is going to cause serious issues, I think, for Yowie. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, what they reported today, I think they, they'd already flagged it earlier in January, uh, along with the fact that their CEO was stepping down and the, mm -hmm. the head of um, the global COO, I think, and head of North America was going to step into the top job. But look, it seems to be with Yowie, it seems to be one disappointment after another. Uh, they lose money, they don't make any money uh, uh, you know, at this stage. They seem to have issues with supply. Uh, there's always new excuses as to why they're not doing well in, in North America, whatever initiative they're mm -hmm. having or changes with supply to Walmart and all these things. I think, look, for us as, as value guys, it's, it's certainly an avoid uh, for first and foremost because they don't make any money. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, this is key, right? I mean, there's a lot of downside risk you can see for Yowie, Tom. But I'm just wondering, I mean, just playing devil's advocate, because obviously, you, you know, you're not interested in the stock, but what would be upside risk for this stock? I mean, if you were trying to search for some sort of growth in this stock, what would you be looking for? Look, you need to, you need to see significant growth. I mean, it should be, I think for us, it should be the thematic makes sense. It should be a good business. Uh, mm. They were wildly popular back in the, in the 90s. Uh, and early 2000s, they got spun out from Cadbury. Um, look, it, I think it should do well. They just need to get their production sorted. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what else. Uh, they're going to need to figure out their North American <coughs> business. That's the great white hope. That's what uh, they've been banging the table about, saying it's going to be huge. And now the, the only moat that they had is looking like it's going to be taken away. So hmm. I think this, uh, the second half of 18 is going to be really important. And if they don't figure it out, then they're going to be in real trouble. I mean, Chris, do you have a view on Yowie? I know it's not a stock you particularly watch, but obviously you would have probably heard the, the news. Do you have a view on it? I didn't hear the news this morning, and the only thing I was thinking as you guys were talking about that then was I have a three-year-old son that probably loves those chocolates. So from <laughs> where I sit anecdotally, it's probably a good buy, but that means nothing, of course. Chris, when, when, you, look forward to, Chris, when you look forward to reporting season um, coming up, what, are you looking for a net positive? I mean, a lot of the analysts we've been having on the show are saying, look, they're expecting a really strong earnings season for Australia. And given what we've seen in confession season, and particularly for some of the retailers, which you may have expected to be quite negative, um, obviously in the past few months we've seen some more positive news coming from retailers, some of the specialties? Yeah, look, I would agree that overall I think we're in for a, a solid, um, hopefully strong reporting season. Mm -hmm. I would have pivoted first to the commodities plays again as um, we continue through the upgrade cycle as uh, analysts out there play catch up with spot prices. Of course, you know, um, prices plugged into models at the moment are still lagging. So that would I would have thought would be the first driver. But mm. yeah, in terms of retail, Ingrid, I totally take your point. There was um, lots of bad news printed into a lot of uh, share prices regarding Amazon. Um, we all know what's happened since. It's been sort of an underwhelming offering to this point. Um, and you've seen the likes of JB Hi-Fi and a few other names really take off. I think still though, retail is one of those uh, very much you're on one side of the le ledger. You're either doing well and growing or on the other side of the ledger, you're like Meyer and you know, you're dying and probably struggling to stay afloat. The key of course is figuring out which is which. So again, there will be pockets of outperformance and certainly there will be pockets of underperformance as well. Mm. All right, Tom, back to you. And I know you're watching a couple of stocks, and these are, these are sort of good, I guess, ahead of reports. But Webjet's one you like, and I just want to get your, your sort of thesis behind that, I guess, and, and why you see growth in this stock, value, I should say. Yeah, Webjet, we, we love Webjet. I think it's, uh, for one thing, it's, it's, it's a popular brand name. Everyone knows Webjet, and they use it. But um, uh, secondarily is the, uh, secondary, sorry, I should say, is their, their move into the, into the B2B space. So everyone knows them. Uh, essentially as being a, you know, a place to find cheap flights and things uh, mm. for the consumer. Where they're focusing all their energy now is on their, their global B2B business. Uh, they're actually now the second largest uh, global B2B player in that space in the world now. Uh, so they just bought Jack Travel, uh, which is a big one, big European B2B. So what they're doing is basically being a middleman between beds and wholesalers mm. uh, and setting up platforms that work in that space and essentially uh, they're aggressively expanding in both America and Europe. Uh, I just think as well, if you look at the financials, I know I keep talking about that we, we're value guys and this is a little, uh, this is a little different. Uh, they're trading on a PE of about 25 times but their expected uh, EPS growth is up in the 30, 35% range, moving up mm. to 40% even the next few years. So if you look <coughs> at it on a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a peg, look at its peg ratio, then it's, it looks like incredibly good value. And I just think that they've got a great name and smart management. So I think they're going to do well. 
All right, I want to shift focus to the banks today because just looking at where the markets are tracking right now, we are seeing the banks all in negative territory. We've obviously heard a bit of news about the banks. We know we've got the Royal Commission, um, you know, this year, so that's going to be a key focus. You're holding ANZ, Chris, and I'm just after um, why, why you're interested in ANZ. I know Macquarie upgraded their forecast on the big four banks. They're outperforming all four of them. What's behind this? Because I guess, are you still looking for yield from the banks? What, uh, I mean, there's obviously a lot of risk to the banks to the downside this year as well. Potential interest rate hikes coming in Australia, that could certainly hurt the banks' housing risks. Um, so why do you like ANZ? So ANZ is our preferred out of the four simply because of their divestments recently and the fact that they're trying to you know, rotate out of businesses that have been underperforming for them. So they've gotten out of large part of Southeast Asia. The more recent one, of course, was selling their insurance division. Um, so again, it's just that rationalisation within yeah. ANZ, pivoting away from things that they don't do well and pivoting back to things that they do do well. And from a valuation perspective, it's probably uh, maybe a little bit behind Westpac, but certainly second of the top four in terms of valuation attractiveness. Um, I agree with your point that there are certainly concerns surrounding the banks, but to this point, they haven't really materialised. So obviously the housing market, just to take an example, and obviously it's a very big one, we haven't seen a deterioration yet um, in bad and doubtful debts. Um, credit lending still remains pretty strong. Um, so yes, while there are risks there, there's always going to be risks there, and like I said, there's probably just not enough, enough evidence yet to suggest that they um, are worth you know, get, uh, selling out of a portfolio, there's, and there's still that yield, yield argue, argument there as well. So happy to hold ANZ, but um, of course that could change very quickly. Where do you stand on the banks, um, Tom? Just interested to get your view, because obviously from a value perspective, they're probably not your top picks, but I mean, do you still have a holding in them? Yeah, look, uh, I, I, we like the banks, uh, you mm. know, and on a value perspective, I don't, I don't think they're, they're bad value. They, they mm. obviously pay a great yield mm. uh, and they're good businesses. They're big businesses. They're not going to go out of business anytime soon. Uh, all this, the, uh, the inquiry and things that are going on now, I think probably provides almost a bit of a buying opportunity in a lot of the mm. banks. Uh, this kind of stuff is just going to clear the decks. I think it's all going to work out to be fine uh, and, and business will go on as usual. So in that regard, I think it's probably not a bad time to look at the banks. Uh, in terms of which one and, and valuations, it's from our point of view, it's a bit of a much of a muchness. They're so mm. well covered by analysts. They're so well looked into. And for us, I think it's basically just buy the cheapest, the cheapest bank. I think Chris was just saying that Westpac is the cheapest. So for us, mm. it would be it would be Westpac right now. You're still getting that good dividend. Uh, and I also I agree with the fact that they're 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 exiting a lot of their their non uh, their non core business or their their kind of their uh, you know their, their businesses that kind of bolt on to their core business, which yep. is their lending business. I think that that's, that's, that's where they should focus. I, I agree with selling the insurance and, mm. uh, and wealth management practices that a lot of them have as well. So I, look, I think that they're moving in the right direction. It's not easy though, Chris, is it? I mean, when you look at sort of what NAB's trying to do, obviously offloading the wealth operations and, and potentially um, the float of its funds management, this part of the market's been somewhat saturated of late. We've seen all the banks do it. I just wonder who would be a buyer of, of this if they were to spin it off? Well, there will always be buyers. It's just really about what price they can command. Um, mm. So, yeah, look, I, I totally take your point. I see the point that um, the market has been flooded with these various divisions, as Tom said, these bolt-on divisions that aren't core to uh, to the bank's operations. But again, it just comes back to price. There, there will be a buyer out there. Um, it's just whether or not the banks can get the, the price that they want for them. Mm. What do you think of that, Tom? Uh, look, I, again, I agree. I think it's... There's going to be buyers out there for them. I mean, some of these wealth management businesses, for instance, have billions of dollars under management. And I think, you know, everyone knows in, in, the, in the financial world how hard it is to get funds under management. Mm. There's got to be people out there interested in that. I mean, just because the banks can't monetize it doesn't mean someone else can't. The banks are obviously under, you know, they've got a lot of red tape and they're under the scope all the time. It's hard with compliance costs and everything to, to mm. make those, business, uh, those businesses profitable. Uh, there's got to be another fund manager or someone out there that's looking to acquire funds under management and, and I'm sure that it'll happen. All right, Tom, I've got another stock I want to get with you uh, shortly, but I want to go back to Chris briefly because, um, Chris, we're seeing the market today now down two tenths of a percent. So we are seeing the miners in the energy space make gains today, though, I should say, against a falling market. Um, are there any in this space that you like? Oil prices up again last night. Chris, are you investing in the energy space at the moment? Yes, I would be happily um, still investing in the oil space and that's just because of the uh, supply and dem demand dynamics that are operating at the moment. So 
I think oil prices will remain pretty well supported due to the fact of the OPEC cuts. Um, of course, the Saudis were agitating recently of extending those cuts out to 2019. I think the key thing in that space, though, is the compliance rate. So traditionally, the compliance rate has uh, been below 80 per cent. At the moment, it's around 85 per cent. So not only have these countries agreed to the production cuts, but they've also stuck to them, which, of course, is probably the most important element. On the other side, you've got a... Um, a growing uh, global growth of course we all know that story and uh, there was some data out overnight from the EIA about uh, supplies in America dropping for a tenth straight week so we've got this environment where supply is constrained demand is picking up and mm. we should all remember that oil prices tend to overshoot in both directions so obviously we're on an upswing at the moment might look expensive at 65 doesn't mean it can't go to 80 so um, just mm. in terms of, of oil price yeah I would be happy to buy probably oil search would be the top pick um, I liked their production report the other day even though the December quarter was a little bit soft over the year it was very strong and then mm. Woodside after that Tom, I want to touch on the commodity space in general with you. I mean, energy and miners. Macquarie coming out yesterday with a big upgrade on BHP's price target to $38. It's sitting at $30.92. So they're pretty bullish on, on BHP for one. Are you seeing any value at the moment in the commodity space at all, whether it be miners or energy, Tom? Just because obviously there are very differing opinions as to whether or not this growth that uh, we've seen can actually continue or be sustained. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's obviously that's a, it's a good question. And... Uh, as, as a general rule of thumb, we, we tend to avoid a lot of the miners just mm. because, uh, again, as value guys, it's hard to uh, it's a hard space to play. I think we've given the you can't control the price of the, the product you dig out of the ground, the lack of pricing power that these companies have. But I mean, if you look at BHP over the last year or so, like haven't they done well? They're, I think they're, they're up about 100 percent. The share price is up about 100 percent. And these bigger companies, they're, they're good businesses. They, you know, they, they cut down when, when the iron ore price was low, they just kept cutting costs, cut costs by 80%. The little players in the game fell off, fell by the wayside. And then what's mm. left of these big corporations when the price ticks back up again, uh, they do fantastically. So look, I, I think in that space, it's, it's a hard one to play. Uh, I can't tell you where I think iron ore prices are gonna go, but mm. uh, look, I think if you, as long as you stick to the big guys, BHP, Rio or Fortescue, they've all done fantastic jobs at cost cutting. When the price falls, they'll cut costs and then they benefit from price increases. So I think that's not a bad way to play it. All right, we're out of time, but it's great to chat to you guys as always. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Tom Madden and Chris uh, Conway there joining us live. We will take a quick break.